Let's talk a little bit about the, the Einstein-Bohr debate. And this is, this is famous stuff, right? Uh, basically, Einstein believed that, that God would create a universe in which we could predict with, uh, we could predict nature. Right? It was de deterministic. He believed that, that, uh, that the, the quantum randomness predicted, right? The, the idea that we could not predict, it was physically impossible to predict the moment of a, a radioactive decay or an electron transition. Right? He found that offensive, and, and this is the famous God does not play dice, right? Um, and, you know, of course, the, the question we might ask is, why does Einstein believe he knows what God would or would not do, okay? Um, but, but this was the thing, and then the Einstein-Bohr debate, basically, uh, uh, Einstein couldn't stand the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? The notion that it could not be known, that the inherent nature of small objects is that we cannot simultaneously know the position or the momentum, right? Or that we can't know the, the simultaneously the energy uh, and the uncertainty of time, right? Okay. Um, and then the other thing he didn't really like was complementarity. Complementarity is the notion that it's that, that particles like photons or electrons or something can act like a wave or, and this is an exclusive or, they'll never simultaneously act as a wave or a particle. Okay. And you know why is why is, does complementarity why is it or does this work and, and the answer is we don't really know this is just the way the universe works that we see, okay. Um, but he didn't like either one of those things, right? Uh, and so this is the 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 the, the history of the Einstein Bohr debate is is an interesting one. And so if you ever get to write a paper in college uh, for physics for poets or something like that, this is a wonderful thing to look up. And, and the arguments are very uh, accessible, right? Uh, to sort of popular science. But let me give you an example here, right? So uh, uh, Bohr would have this perfectly good conference. This is a conference, um, uh, and here's here's uh, Bohr himself right there, right? This is Heisenberg right there. Uh, this is Wolfgang Pauli, right? Uh, Otto Stern, Lisa Meitner, okay, Leidenberg. I forgot his first name, right? Okay, so there's, you know, who's who, right? This is a big conference there. Uh, uh, this guy's going to end up missing the conference, okay, and because what happens is uh, uh, Einstein shows up at the conference, right, and he gives this Gedanken experiment. That's a German word that just means thought, okay, uh, and this is not an experiment that we could actually do, but it's an experiment that he can think through, and um, if he can, you know, if the experiment works, why he's disproven, in this case, he's actually going after complementarity, okay, but it's just a thought experiment, okay, so here's the notion. Um, the electron beam comes in here, right? And what we do is we put a little light across here, right? We shine a beam of light across there. Laser beam detector. These didn't exist at the time. This is why it was only a, you know, a dream experiment, right? Okay. Um, and what we do is we get the electron to create an interference pattern here, right? Okay. Will we get an interference pattern? And then simultaneously, will we determine which slit the electron went through? Now remember, the electron going through one slit versus the other slit, that's particle behavior, right? The electron making an interference pattern here, that's wave behavior, right? So he's going to get it to act like a particle. That is, it's going to go through this slit or this slit. If it doesn't go through this slit, then it went through this one, right? We just write down which slit they go through, and then we've got it acting like a particle and a wave, right? Well, you know, so Einstein presents this to Bohr. Bohr looks at this and like, oh, crap. Here's an example of electrons doing both. It's acting like a particle. It's going through one slit versus the other, and it's acting like a wave. Now, remember, the Copenhagen idea here is that the electron is this crazy particle wave that makes the interference pattern, right? Okay, so, you know, it's kind of a crazy thing there, right? So, you know, what happens? Well, Bohr would go for a walk and he'd miss the conference. He'd sit there and like argue this out with, with uh, uh, his buddies, right? And then he'd eventually come up with why this doesn't disprove complementarity, okay? Um, right, okay, so we've got that, right? But complementarity says it must be either, okay? So the question is, do we get this interference pattern or not? Right, and of course, you know, you take a walk. Here's here's uh, Enrico Fermi walking with Bohr, and Bohr's like, like, dang it, you know, it's the double slits, and then blah blah blah, right? 
you know? Here's Bohr's reply, and the, and the answer is this, right? The answer is no interference pattern would have happened. And the reason why is that the light, uh, this, this light shining through here, you can't observe electrons neutrally. If an electron's going through there and you hit it with a photon, well, the photon can have as much, in, as mo much momentum as that electron, right? And so you're totally going to change the momentum of the electron with the light. Observing the electron changes the electron's momentum, right? Now, remember that the de Broglie wave equation says that, that, that uh, momentum is Planck's constant over the wavelength, right? So therefore, the wavelength is uh, Planck's constant over the momentum. If you've changed the momentum, you've changed the wavelength. If you've changed the wavelength of the electron beam, you don't get an interference pattern because to have interference, the electrons have to be monochromatic. Now, that's, that means one color, right? But what we mean is all one wavelength. All the wavelengths have to be the same. If you recall last year when we did this with sound and we made the loud, soft, loud, soft, I had the same frequency coming out of both speakers. If I'd sent white sound through those speakers, you, wouldn't, you would have had no interference pattern. It would have been just equally annoying everywhere in the room. Okay, So the light shining across here, okay, the light shining across there changes the momentum of the electrons, changes its wavelength, prevents the interference pattern from occurring. And, and you can... Yeah, I can't remember how many, um, I think, you know, three or four at least, Einstein challenged uh, this thing. And there's always some way that it, it um, complementarity happens, right? So complementarity is this deeply rooted thing in uh, uh, existence, right? It's this thing, we don't know why it can act as a wave exclusive or a particle, but it just is the way it is, okay? If you figure out why, well, then, you know, you get a little closer to uh, the God that apparently does play dice, right? Okay. So complementarity is intact. So this is the deal, right? Bohr always won, right? So apparently God does play with dice, right? The description of nature is in the small scale quantum, right? So there are sort of our three types of physics. There is Newtonian classical stuff, deterministic physics, like we learned last year, right? The the ball flying through the air lands at a particular spot, right? Right. There's relativity, which is still classical. It's just that we got to adjust our thinking as we approach the speed of light. Like mass doesn't stay constant, and et cetera, et cetera, right? And then, basically, quantum mechanics is the physics of small things. Right. If we're going to deal with things, you know, Planck's constant is you know uh, six point six two six times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds, right? Well, if that's a significant amount of energy, you know, right, to you, if you're an electron, well, then that can't be neglected. But a baseball, you can neglect that sort of uh, an energy, right? Because that's, you know, joule times seconds, right? Okay, so, so um, quantum mechanics is really only applies to very small objects, and very small objects don't act don't think of them as, you know, baseball, electrons are not uh, billiard balls, okay? Um, the correspondence principle, though, states that any quantum, any quantum theory, if you expand it out to predict large things, it has to correspond, it has to, when you expand it out and talk about large things, it eventually collapses and becomes the same thing that we understood for Newton. Same thing's true for relativity. All these formulas, if you slow the speed down, it also is, is what we studied last year, okay?